I know that uh, you who are students in the course have a relatively mixed background, so um, don't be shy to ask a lot of questions. And I will try to keep my presentation to maximum 45 minutes, so there will be room for many questions. And if I, if you think it's completely ununderstandable, just break in <laughs> while I speak. I have no, I have no trouble with that. Uh, so. Yeah, I think the task given by Tommy is to try to sort of talk around the neutrons. So what do we have to do to complement our neutron experiments? What do we need to know before we go? And what should we maybe do afterwards to get a more complete picture? And I thought this is super open <laughs> and very difficult to talk about. So I decided to take one concrete example to show what did we do before we went to Grenoble for the first time and what did we do afterwards and what do the different uh, type of studies, uh, what picture do we get from uh, a combination of measurements. So the title of my talk could have been alpha synuclein membrane interactions. So I'm going to talk about the protein called alpha synuclein and how it interacts with membranes and how we have studied this with different biophysical techniques and with neutrons. So I will divide my talk in, in principle three parts. So one part, which is the middle part, is what did we do? I will not explain anything about neutron refractometry or scattering because I think you all know that from other parts of the course. I will just tell you what we did and what we found, show some curves, but that is sort of the middle part of the talk. So this is the time axis here, which is of course a very long time axis. I think it's an axis of a decade. Uh, so I will start to tell you what did we do before. So what did we do to learn anything about this interaction before we had our first neutron time so that we would actually spend those, I think we had 72 hours. Tommy probably remembers exactly how many hours we had. <laughs> I think we had 72 hours and that sounds like a lot of hours, but it's not. So <laughs> you have to spend that time really wisely. So you, you get something out of it. Um, and then in the end, I will also tell you what did we do afterwards. Um, and there will actually be two neutron segments. So there will be like a neutron and then a little bit in between and a new neutron segment. Um, uh, and just to make sure uh, that you don't believe I have done everything, even if I do work a lot in the lab, I have really not done everything in this project. I have done, I don't know what I have done. I have done some protein expression and purification and a lot of sample making. Uh, when you are at the neutron time, it's a lot of intense sample making because some of our samples are time dependent and we have to prepare them fresh before uh, we do the measurement so that we know uh, something about the conditions of, of the samples. And many PhD students, Eric Hellstrand, I think was the first, Ricardo Gaspar, Tina has not worked so I can remember in mind, but she's done a lot on alpha synuclein, so you will see some of her work. Simon Friedol. Kashka Makachevic and Maria Dubakik and Jun Palbu Arbison. These are the PhD students. Marie Gray was a very early postdoc in the project. She was also there in the first uh, measurements in Grenoble, and Eric was too. And then Elia came in a few later, so years later as a postdoc. Uh, and Katja has been helping us with a lot of alpha silicon purifications and validation of the quality. Uh, and then there are some other se seniors besides me involved in the project. And of course, collaborators, and many more than I have listed. So if you listen and your name is not there, um, yeah, I hope you're not too much offended because there are, of course, a lot of more people involved, both in Lund and elsewhere in the world who has helped in this project. Um, so the project on alpha synuclein membrane interactions is part of a wide project we run uh, in Lund uh, and in collaboration with others, where we try to understand lipid protein co-aggregation or co-assembly. Uh, and we call it lipid protein co-aggregation from lipid rich to peptide rich. So you may have co-assemblies that are lipid rich, like membrane associated proteins. Here's a lot of lipids relative to the amount of peptide mass in the co-aggregates that you can call this if you want, biological membrane. Uh, there are other features that are relatively lipid rich that are these lipoprotein particles that are present in your blood, especially after having had 
bacon and cheese and stuff like that for breakfast, you, you get an enormous amount of this lipoprotein particles where protein serves to carry the lipids so you would not die from the massive lipid insults. So it makes water soluble particles of the lipids. Uh, and then you have proteins like albumin that you have in your blood, which in principle interact with everything. It also interacts with lipids. So you can find crystal structures of the protein with like eight lipid chains inside. Uh, and then going to even more protein rich, we have amyloid fibrils that somehow interact and co-assemble with lipids. And then you could have this lipid transport proteins for lipocalin, which are like maybe only one uh, lipid per protein in the complex. So there's a whole uh, spectrum of uh, ratios of lipid to protein that can exist in coagulation. And of course, many, many more examples than those in on this slide. Uh, and the project we are working on, alpha synuclein membrane interaction, is motivated by uh, the literature. Uh, and there are lots of reports in the literature. So uh, in the beginning, maybe I should tell you that in the beginning, we wanted to understand the aggregation of this protein, which is linked to Parkinson's disease. But there's also a lot of literature saying that the aggregates that form in biology contain lipids. So it's not only proteins. So this is some kind of fluorescence microscopy where lipids and protein have, have different color and you can look at if they are co-aggregated co or not. Uh, and there are other, other studies also. So there are quite a lot of studies where people have tried to look at the composition of those sort of plaques and deposits you have in, in, in the brain. Um, but what I will talk about here is not so much this amyloid side where we some often have the hourglass uh, or the looking glass. We often have the looking glass here uh, also. So in this project, I'm going to talk about, we actually are on this side. So here we look at protein interaction with membrane. So this is more like a lipid-rich um, domain that we're looking at. Uh, so we study the interaction between alpha synuclein, which in principle is a disordered protein in solution, with phospholipid membrane surfaces. Uh, and we ask a number of questions, some of which can be addressed with neutrons and some cannot. Um, so we ask like questions like affinity, what is the distribution between free and bound? That is affinity. Stoichiometry, that means how many proteins per lipid or how many lipids per protein, I guess you want to say because the lipids are smaller than the protein. So how many lipids per protein are there when the surface is saturated? So, so what is sort of the maximum ratio you could have? Or what is the, what is the condition above which you cannot bind more protein to the membrane? Uh, and then binding mechanism, you may want to know, do these proteins, if there are many, of course, there would be many on a big membrane, are they bound totally independent of one another? Or is there some kind of cross talk? Um, we want to know what is the structure of the bound protein and what is its penetration depth in the membrane? Does it bind like in this cartoon in the upper a side layer or does it penetrate in, or in the head group area or does it penetrate into the sort of more hydrophobic acyl layer, or maybe it even goes through the membrane. Some of those questions you can actually address with neutrons. Um, we also want to know what are the consequences for the membrane. Does it disrupt? Does it thin? Does it swell? That you can also, also look at with membranes. And you may want to know what are the consequences for the protein. The protein may change conformation as it associates with the membrane. And it's also relevant to ask, does this process have anything to do with the self-assembly of the protein to form amyloid fibrils? And is there any uptake of lipids? That's another question you may want to know. Uh, and of course, there is this difficult question, which I think I leave to others. <laughs> I have to confess that I'm a physical chemist. Maybe I'm also a biochemist, I don't know. But I don't do biological studies. So I leave this question to others. But it's, of course, that's what you want to know. Of course, you do all this physical chemistry to address questions that are probably relevant to biology. But I can't do those studies. Someone else had to do them. Um, so uh, let's start with one of the players. So we have two players here. We have a lipid membrane and we have a protein. So the protein, alpha synuclein, has a very 
I would say, I guess you can see the whole protein. I see us on top of the protein, but yeah, I will move us like that uh, just to be sure. Um, the protein has an unusual amino acid sequence. So here red is negatively charged and blue is positively charged and orange is hydrophobic and white is hydrophilic. They are the black here, the hydrophilic ones. Uh, so sometimes alpha synuclein is said to have imperfect repeats. So there are a number of, of short segments that are similar to one another, but they are not exactly identical. Um, and another very distinct feature is the asymmetric charge distribution. So if you look at the negative charges, you have an enormous accumulation of negative, negatively charged residues. Residues that are negatively charged at neutral pH, I would say, they are all not all, but many of them are in the C-terminal region of the protein. So somewhere off the residue 97 and up. And there is really, there is the last lysine and then it's only negative. And then you have a, a core that is super hydrophobic. There is a, like, these two are matching our, each other, plus and minus. So this is zero charge for 35 residues. And that is called the NAC domain. And NAC stands for non-amyloid core, and this is exactly the place that forms the amyloid. Uh, and that sounds like a silly name, but it's called non-amyloid non core because it's not amyloid beta. Uh, so that's how it got its name. Um, and then this N-terminal region is what we call amphiphatic. So it's like hydrophobic, but there is quite a lot of both positive and negative charge residues. So I think there's even more positive than negative. So this one is net positive and this tail is net negative. So that's the protein. It's a relatively unusual uh, sequence. And when it's alone, so to say, in water solution or in a weak buffer, it's, it is more, more or less random. It's, it doesn't have any preferred structure. Um, so now I will probably move us again over here where we were. Um, and um, what do we do to get this protein? So we need a protein for our study. It's even smaller. Uh, we express it in E. coli. So many of you in the audience do that. Not all of you, but when we make our protein, we, we take the gene, we make actually a synthetic gene uh, with E. coli optimized codons. It's with E. coli, we just love to express it. So tRNA composition would match the sequence. Uh, and we make it with no tags, and I think that is very important. So we just make this sequence, starting with this methionine, ending with this alanine. So many people who do proteins add tags to them, but that is very problematic because tags may help you in the initial isolation step. Uh, it well, very seldom gives you a pure protein. So there are other ways to isolate proteins, and moreover, if you have a tag, you have to clean off the tag because the tag will change the properties of the protein. So before you do your studies, you have to clean it off. But that's often expensive because proteases are expensive, especially when you need large amounts of protein. And then you need to purify away both the protease and the tag. So it actually makes the purification procedure often take more time and cost a lot more. So I always recommend express as is and then use the physical chemical properties of the protein to design a purification protocol. And in this case, we use this fantastic property of the protein being resistant to boiling. So after we have lysed the cells, we just boil the, the lysate and centrifuge, boil cooled centrifuge, and then we get rid of almost all the E. coli proteins. And then what stays in the supernatant, we run through two and ion exchange steps in sequence. One that is a coarse pass flow uh, pool resolution to capture. It's more like a capture release step. And then we do another one that is high resolution, slower, uh, where we get the protein really pure. And then finally, we do even size exclusion to make sure we have the monomer. Uh, because in this case, we want to add a monomer to membranes. Um, not aggregated state. In, uh, and in other studies, we may want to monitor the aggregation, and then we need to know that we start from monomer. And what we then do after all this purification is we run it on an SDS page gel. And these are just where different molecular weights would run. So the smaller they are, the further they go down, down in the gel. Uh, and this is our purified protein. So this is what you want. You, you don't want to see other bands there. And this is relatively high load. So you have to add high concentration of your protein to be able to judge that there are no other proteins. 
Uh, and my recommendation when you want to do any kind of studies is always purify until you see no other bands on silver stained SDS page. This is chromatic. So you do it even better if you silver stain because then you can see if there are any weak bands. And you don't want small molecule contaminants. And that you can easily see by NMR spectroscopy if there are other things in the solution than your protein. Uh, and you also have to validate that you actually have the protein you think you have by mass spectrometry. So intact weight, but also fragment just to be sure it's the correct protein. It has happened to me that I once got an E. coli protein <laughs> instead of my uh, overexpressed protein. Uh, and that one, it happens to have exactly spot on the doors on the same intact molecular weight. But when we fragmented it, it was clear that I had purified a chlorine chemical resistance protein. And then just start over again, you have to do to get your protein. So you really have to do this so you know that you, you study. Uh, and my, my advice is that, I mean, you may study a protein you can buy. I know a lot of people buy proteins, but then you do the same, you purify it because they are never pure. They're all often so, sold very impure. They may be 90%, so that's like 10% other proteins, and then there's a lot of small molecules that they don't tell you. So you really have to purify it before you use it. If you use a protein that is found at a reasonable cost in any kind of catalog. So that's about the protein. You have to be very careful. Uh, the other player we have are the lipids. Uh, and in this case, when you study protein membrane binding, I think you have two choices. One is to extract biological membranes. Uh, from cells or tissues and then purify them, uh, which means they will have more or less a natural composition uh, of lipids because the biological membranes are relatively complex, but you may also then have other proteins if, yeah, depending on how you purify the lipids. So you will then of course have a less pure preparation and you will have a variation both in head groups and uh, acyl chains on the lipids. Um, so that's the disadvantage, but the advantage is that it's more representative of a biological membrane. Although when you purify and then make often liposome vesicles out of these lipids, you often scramble them. So a biological membrane may be asymmetric, but then you make a symmetric one. So we often work with lipid model, lipid model systems, so model lipid membranes where we have defined components. Um, for example, cytoionic, which means it has no charge, zero or negatively charged. So this is called d choline, and this is called d serine. So di means that there are two oleol chains, so you have 18 carbons and one double bond. Um, and then we also work with those lipids that are called ganglocytes, and I think this is GM1, uh, which have, they have often a little bit of a mix of acyl chains because they are purified from, from actually from I think brain tissue or maybe some other tissue. And then they have this very peculiar head group, which is huge and sugar-based. Um, but this is also interesting and relevant because they are found a lot in, in, in neurons where, where alpha synuclein is present. So this is our model, model lipids, and then we mix them in defined ratio. So we can have 100% this one, we can have 100% this, and we can have a defined ratio, or we can have this one and this one. So we make them at will uh, with the composition we want. Um, and then and you often then dry them as a film and, and disperse them and, and you make vesicles through extrusion or sonication depending on what properties you want or electrode formation. Um, so I will go to start now before we go to the neutrons to tell you what did we do before. <laughs> so what did we learn before we, I think it's even so that you cannot get neutron time unless you can show some preliminary data from other methods that you actually know something about your system. So after expressing and purifying it, we studied the adsorption of the protein to membranes uh, with different techniques, uh, circular dichroism spectroscopy, quartz crystal microbalance, and confocal fluorescence microscopy. So the first method, CD, I, just, I will just tell you like in one minute what it is, but you use circularly polarized light, which is um, one component of plain polarized light. So if you have plain polarized light, which is this arrow in between E2 that uh, oscillates up and down uh, uh, as it propagates, you can 
mathematically divided into two components, and you can also do it by a pocket cell implicitly divided into two components or one or the other. So one that goes in this direction, ER, so it goes from here, here, so these are different time points, and then you have the other component, which is left-hand circularly polarized. Uh, but the sum of these two components is always the plain polarized wave. And what you do is that you take those two components, either you take plane polarized wave and you measure the tilting of the um, polarization direction, or you alternately excite your sample with those two waves and measure how they are differentially absorbed. So what happens is that if this cuvette which has your sample contains chiral molecules, one component may be more absorbed than the other one, and they may even come out, out of phase because it's also optically by refringing to this contains chiral molecules. Uh, and in principle, in, when you do circular dichroism spectroscopy, there are two ranges. Of course, there are many ranges, but there are two ranges relevant for proteins. One is called near UVCD, which uh, measures spectra from aromatic side chains and disulfide bonds. And the other range is called far UVCD, 185 to 250 nanometers, as you say here, where you look at the peptide backbone. So the peptide backbone chromophores. Uh, and you get different types of spectra, and they can be quite, uh, I wouldn't say featureless, featureful, lots of little peaks, uh, but still relatively featureless given like you have a protein of 140 residues, and if it forms an alpha helix, you get like two negative peaks and one positive peak out of all of that. Uh, but the important thing is that different secondary structures give distinctly different spectra. And that you can use when you study proteins. And you can definitely use this method to study changes in structure. So this we employed for alpha synuclein. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So the black here is protein alone, which looks like a random coil. If we go back here, it looks like a green spectrum. Uh, so when the protein is in solution, it's more or less a random coil. And then we study different lipid to protein ratios. So the more towards red we go, the more lipid we have per protein molecule. So you can see how the spectrum gradually changes to one that looks like an alpha helix. And if we take, and this has no assumed that this is the <laughs> this is the signal at 222 nanometers, which is one of the distinct negative peaks for alpha helix. And if we plot that uh, ellipticity here, you can see how it goes down more negative uh, as a function of lipid to protein ratio and it plateaus somewhere here. So that gives us actually a stoichiometry. It, this curve doesn't give us affinity. It tells us that affinity is high because it's a sharp inflection point uh, relative to the protein concentration used here. But at least we can see that when membranes are added in the form of liposomes to the protein, protein adopts a helical structure. And the uh, amount of protein adsorbed to the lipid seems to saturate somewhere around the lipid to protein ratio of 160 to 200, somewhere here. Um, this doesn't tell us at all which part of the protein forms the helix, or if it's all of it, and then some of it, uh, of some fraction of time, all of it, and some fraction, some of, none of it, uh, because this is just a bulk and time average of what goes on in the solution. So we don't get any detailed information, but we can tell that helices are formed somewhere in the protein. Um, and the other technique we use is called quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation, where you, in principle, have a cantilever. Uh, with some kind of coating, and you measure the vibration frequency of that cantilever and also the damping. Um, and that will change. So, I mean, this is in principle a little surface. If something adsorbs on the surface, it will be more heavy, the frequency will go down, and also the damping may change depending on the structure or the adsorbed layer here. So, you can measure in principle something that reports on the mass. Bound, so when you can inject something and then can inject buffer, it goes up again. But you can also get some type of structural, crude structural information from, from the damping. Um, and in the case, 
here we deposited a bilayer on the sensor and then we flew over. So this is an alpha cell nucleon coming on in here over the membrane. So we can study how it goes on and off. And we actually mainly saw it come on because the off seems to be very slow. Uh, and here are data uh, for proteins. So the frequency here is the blue goes down in good to get different overtones goes down when we inject the protein, which means that the ca this cantilever gets more heavy, something is bound, and the damping also changes. Uh, and here is the same thing at another pH, and these are the charged, these are the negatively charged membranes. So we have uh, both the switch ionic and the negatively charged in the mixture here. Uh, and we repeated the same thing. Oops, now we went backwards, I should go forwards. We repeated the experiment with the switch ionic membranes and then we saw no or very little absorption so we can really say here that we need some fraction at least 10 to 30 percent of the negatively short lipids to see absorption of the protein which of course is a bit um, what you call it, intriguing because the protein as a whole has a net negative charge although i think you saw that it was relatively polarized uh, in its charge distribution and these are just some results from confocal microscopy, where we use one fluorophore in giant unilamellar vesicles. So they are like many micrometers big, so we can see them. Uh, and we use another fluorophore in the proteins. In principle, the membrane is red and the protein is green. Um, so we can actually see here in the microscope that we get co-localization of the protein onto the membranes. Um, so to summarize what we know before we go to the neutrons is that the protein absorbs to anionic memory. So that's important. So we wouldn't waste time at the neutron beam using switch ionic bilayers. That would have been a bit stupid, unless we want a negative control. Then we can use this one and then set up the exact same experiment. Um, so we can do binding studies if we want to know how the protein absorbs and what is the structure of the bound protein using these membranes. This we cannot study by neutrons, but it's good to know that there is helical formation. It's not only us, not, lots of people have reported the same. Uh, and this uh, we actually see by other measurements. I will show you a little bit of N, NMR data in the end. So we actually know that it's the N-terminal part and others have shown also is the N-terminal central part of the protein that contacts the membrane and this C-terminal part is actually relatively disordered and extend into solution. So that may explain actually why it can go down to negatively charged membranes. So it uses the part of the protein that is actually net positive and the negative part sticks out from the membrane. Uh, so what did we then do uh, at the beam? Uh, we did both neutron reflectometry and scattering. Um, and we wanted to know what is the structure of the bound protein, especially uh, what is the penetration depth. So I think this is the main question we could address. What is the penetration depth of the protein? Um, so how would we address this with neutrons? Uh, and could we address the same with other methods? And what are the consequences of this? Um, so we use this uh, technique called contrast matching. So we have uh, we do the reflectometry of a neutron beam, and then we have surface, and on the surface we have deposited our membrane, and then we can, of course, also add protein. So we used uh, either protein or lipid deuterated so that we could, in H2, we would see both, but we can then do what's CMSI, where you, you can actually cancel the lipids, or you can use d to cancel the protein. So you would actually see the structure of one or the other uh, in these measurements. And I think these are Tommy's, Tommy's little, um, not so little actually, <laughs> as a protein chemist uh, nowadays, you typically work in the microliter, max milliliter scale. And then we get these devices that require 25 milliliter protein. And that is when you're super happy that you have a clone, you can express it yourself, you don't have to buy it, you don't have to buy proteases, you express it as is. So you can actually scale up your protein expression and purification without too high costs. And of course, I should also say that we got fantastic help from ILL. They have a deuteration facility, so we didn't have to pay for the deuterated protein. They expressed that for us 
shipped us the cell pellet and we then purified it in Lund. So that's a fantastic service because deuterated media, deuterated chemicals are of course expensive. So here are some examples of our data. So we did all the scattering in three different contrasts and I will not go into details of this, how it was recorded or fitted because I know you have that in other parts of the course, but in principle what we got here was uh, we used this bilayer slab model. We could get the thickness of the membrane and we could also get if there were any kind of features in, in the membrane. So when the protein is there, you can actually see that it, it becomes asymmetric. Um, and what we learned, so I will tell you what we learned from the study. What we learned was that the protein actually is at the very top of the membrane. It doesn't go into the hydrophobic region and doesn't go down. It doesn't make a pore. It really just sort of adsorbs. So adsorption is actually a good term for this binding interaction. It adsorbs in the upper layer, in the head group area, maybe a little bit into the upper ACI layer, but definitely not very deep into the membrane. Uh, so that is what we now know. Uh, if we summarize what we know after the pre-studies and, and the neutron studies. So we now know that we have sort of anionic membranes. Uh, we know we form a helix. We know only N-terminal part contacts. The c terminal this we knew before, but now we also know this. We know how the protein is located in, in the membrane, in the, in the head group and upper ACI layer and not penetrating any deeper. Uh, and that is very important. Um, we also, of course, had some indications on that from confocal because we never saw the protein inside the vesicles. So it really didn't go through and was not released on the other side. Uh, so now I'll tell you a little bit about what, how we have continued. Uh, what more do we now know about alpha cellular membrane interactions? Uh, so from NMR spectroscopy, uh, which is still not published, uh, we can run NMR spectrum. This was data from HSQC NMR where you in principle get one peak for every residue in the protein. So you have N15 labeled proteins. Now it's a different isotope now, it's not due to us anymore. And this should say spectroscopy, it's always misspelled. Uh, and then we do that different lipid to protein ratios. And I think the blue is the free protein. And you can, I think, easily see how this region, the first hundred residues disappear, like at the high lipid to protein ratio where we you remember we have saturation somewhere between 160 and 200. So when we are at the saturation limit, where in principle all protein is bound, we don't see any of the first 100 residues. But when we are below saturation, we actually do see, depending on the ratio, some of those residues um, at weak intensity, but not totally lost. So what this tells us is that the protein actually absorbs with different parts. So this CD couldn't tell us. CD spectroscopy could just tell us that we form a helix. But combined with this, we can say that when we have less lipid to protein, the protein does what it can to actually be on the vesicles, but only a small part interacts uh, with the vesicle, the part that's gone in the NMR, NMR spectrum. And when you then increase, gradually increase the amount of lipids, the protein adsorbed with a larger and larger fraction forming the helix, but never more than the first 100 residues, because it, this, this negative tail cannot form a helix on the membrane. So that's very important information that the binding mode, or what you would call it, the bound structure changes as a function of the lipid to protein ratio. Um, but what happens when you go in excess? If you have more lipids, or we have more membrane surface, then so that you we actually have adsorbed all protein and then add even more membrane, what happens then? Um, so these are data also from Kasia Makasheri, very interesting data. So she did confocal microscopy uh, in bright field mode, where you can see a bunch of vesicles. So these are just two different areas for the, of the sample. These are giant you know, lamella vesicles again, so you can actually see them scale bar here is 10 micrometers. Uh, and the super interesting observation she made was that she could see many vesicles in bright field. And when then she looked in fluorescence mode, where the protein is now the only player that's fluorescently labeled, only some of the vesicles were lighting up. 
and they seem to have protein around the whole uh, periphery uh, or whole surface. So this is like a cartoon showing there was this vesicle, but there was no fluorescence. And this is another area where some of the vesicles, like this one is fluorescent, this one is fluorescent, but this big one here is not fluorescent. So that was a fantastic and very intriguing observation. Um, and what you often see, it seems like you often see that, oh, small ones have proteins, big ones have not. But this is definitely not the curvature effect, um, because even the 5 micrometer GV, I mean, these are almost 10 here, yeah, the protein, the protein is here, and this is the vesicle. So if you look at the protein, the protein sees the membrane has a flat, flat surface at this size of vesicles. So it can't be a curvature effect. So there must be another explanation for the small, small or some vesicles being filled first. Um, and what Kasia did then to make sure it's not lipid segregation between vesicles, she also did just pure POPS vesicles and saw the same phenomenon. Uh, and also when she over titrated, with protein, all vesicles had bound proteins. It was not so that there was something strange with some vesicles that they couldn't bind protein. It was just that the protein very unevenly distributed when there was excess membrane surface. Uh, and the conclusion of Kasha's study is that this is due to cooperative binding of the protein to the membrane. So cooperative binding means that the protein uh, any incoming protein rather binds to a surface where there is already protein compared to the independent binding situation where it would bind to any vesicles and they would be just randomly distributed over the vesicles. So it's not random binding, it's independent binding. This is random, this is random because it's random events. But if it's cooperative, then they accumulate on some vesicles, whereas when it's independent, they just spread out uh, according to the Pascal triangle. Um, and this is some simulations or calculations that uh, Kasia did uh, showing some, of course, these are fake systems. So if you have only two binding sites or if you have 10 binding sites per vesicle, the vesicles, of course, are much bigger. But what she shows here is that if you have two, independent binding means that at half saturation, half of the vesicles have one, 25% have two, and 20% have zero bound when you have exactly half saturation. Whereas when you have cooperative binding, you get less of the half saturated and most of the vesicles have either zero or one, zero, sorry, zero or two bound. Uh, but if you go to 10 binding sites, this is the independent binding showing all the different states with, for example, one, two, three, et cetera, proteins bound per vesicle. Then the sort of Cooperativity, although she uses the same free energy coupling between binding events in the two and 10 case, you can see that when you have 10 coupled binding events, you in principle totally suppress any intermediates and you get only vesicles that are completely empty or completely filled. Uh, and of course, a real vesicle may have thousand binding sites. So it's, it's the explanation for this sort of seemingly super strong cooperativity is that it doesn't have to be stronger per binding event, but the fact that you have so many cooperating, cooperating means that you can actually completely suppress the intermediates. Um, yeah, I think I just have a little bit more time. We also looked at vesicle shape, and that's one thing you can also address with cryo -EM, but you can also address it with neutron scattering. Then you can't have the deposited membrane, so now we instead have vesicles in solution, again the constant, contrast matching, and we want to know, is the protein bound like this, that we saw on the flat membrane, does it go in, is, does it penetrate? And mainly we want to know, okay, are the vesicles deformed uh, when the protein is, is bound? And we do this trick of contrast matching. So we either match out the protein and see only the vesicles, or we match out the lipids and see only the protein. Uh, so we can, in principle, have a situation that looks like this. Uh, when you have protein only and vesicle, and of course the vesicle is not so big, it's <laughs> built the entire cubic, this is a fake image. Um, yeah, so what we did here again was this contrast variation, uh, and we also, of course, could have been earlier in the validation, what you have to do also 
when you do this contrast matching studies, you have to also validate what is your deuteration percentage of the deuterated protein. It's not always ideal to have it 100% deuterated. In this study, we want to 75% because then it's easier to match out. And then we did a, a mass spec, so we have the sort of molecular weight. And for the molecular weight, we could calculate how many deuterons are there on average, or how many protons are there on average. And then we know the number of residues, we know the number of groups that can exchange, and then we could actually find out uh, how, how much. And we aimed for 75 and got 76, so that wasn't so bad. Um, and then we looked through neutron scattering at uh, the vesicle deformation. And the best fit to our data is actually that when you have at some protein, lipid to protein ratios, you have to get uh, a deformation. You, you need to use an elliptical model uh, to fit the data. You can't fit it any longer with a spherical model. Um, and that has also been seen uh, using cryo, uh, cryo EM, where you can look at vesicle shape. So um, I will almost stop, uh, but I will just tell you also that we don't only look at alpha cellular membrane interaction, we also look at the formation of aggregates, fibrillar aggregates, because that is the process that's going on in. Parkinson's disease, although nobody knows what's toxic, it may be some intermediate. We're still very interested in uh, the formation of aggregates and in the formation of coaggregates. Are lipids taken up in these uh, aggregates? And we want to know a lot about these things. We want to know about their composition. We want to know their structure. Is there any selectivity in lipid uptake? Uh, is there any kind of mechanism for lipid uptake? And what are the consequences? So th th there are lots of questions again. Um, and I just want to show this because this is not neutrons, but this is one of the coolest confocal images we have. Again, with the red labeled lipids. Uh, and if we add aggregates, we can see how aggregates accumulate in certain patches of the membrane. And the membrane, I mean, this looks like they have actually taken up lipids. And then if we continue and add protein, so first we added unlabeled protein, then we add labeled protein, then we can see how the labeled protein actually adheres somehow to where there was already a, a patch of absorbed proteins and how you get uh, lipids incorporated in, in the growing aggregates. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, and I think I should stop there. The only thing I will tell you actually, I, and then of course you do contrast matching again and try to know something about the structure. I will just show you this because this is something irrelevant for membranes maybe, but probably it is. Um, because when you pack all these proteins close on the membrane, you probably change the properties of the protein because there will be an electrostatic interaction between all those negatively charged proteins. Um, and it, but in this study that I show you, we instead looked at what happens when the protein alone, without lipids, form a fibril. Um, this is again the sequence, and we can forget the mutant for now, but this is again the sequence. Just different color coding showing again this super negative C-terminal tail. These are models of fibrils that people have acquired. Um, so these are taken from the literature, but in principle you have a core, which is this part, uh, and then you have the N-terminal tail and you have the C-terminal tail, as unstructured appendices on the, on the fibril. Uh, so we asked here, what does this mean to the PK values of, of, of these acidic groups? Will they be more prone to actually uh, ac accept protons when they're packed so close together? Uh, and the experiments that Tina, so Tina Palma, doctor, did almost all of these experiments. She did three types of experiments. And uh, one was just using a pH electrode. So the wild type, which is here, she formed monomers, she dissolved monomers, and then she measured the pH of the monomers in solution in water when there is no buffer. The only buffer is the protein itself. You end up somewhere here, 5.6. And then she let fibrils form. And then after fibrils had formed, she measured the pH again. And then the pH had increased by 0.9 units to 6.5. Just because of the self-assembly of the monomers into fibrils. She used pH indicator where you get a color change when the fibril changes, uh, pH changes, or when the fibrils form. 
And she used NMR spectroscopy, where you use the fact that not all monomers are incorporated in the fibrils. So there's always some, because the solubility is high enough that there are always some monomers left in the fibrillar sample. And then she looked at the histidines of the monomers in solution. You don't see the fibrils, you only see the monomers in solution. And from the chemical shift change of the histidine, she could also calculate the pH before and after. So all of this ended up in, in a situation where pH increases as fibrils forms. That means the proton concentration in solution has gone down. Because higher pH is less protein, lower pH is more protein. So something must have taken up protons and that is the fibrils uh, that form. They take up protons from the solution because their pK values or effective pK values are elevated. And from the pH change and from knowing how much monomer was left in solution, uh, which actually then changes its uh, protonation state also because of the pH change. So that is like the intrinsic problem. She could calculate uh, the pK value change upon fibril formation, and that was like 1.1 units. So that's quite high. Uh, and after this, I will actually stop talking so that you have a chance to ask questions. Okay, I think there is a question already from Radhika who had raised her hand, so please. Yes. Um, hi, Sarah. Thank you so much Hello. for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, so I have one question. One is that you probably mentioned it, but I, I guess I missed it. Like how when you made the vesicles and the lipids and then how did you make sure that it's like a proper uh, bilayer uh, structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good question. And I didn't say it. So when we made the vesicles, so we made the vesicles in place at ILL. Uh, so we made them through, through extrusion, through membranes. Right. And then we did actually DLS. So they have equipment there. So that's also important to know that when you go to a uh, neutron source, you have to book in advance what other okay. equipment you need. So we measured the size distribution and polydispersity. Yeah, so the average size and polydispersity of our vesicles on site. On site. On yeah, site. so exactly the ones that go into the cuvette are characterized. All right. Mm -hmm. um, oh, if I could ask one more. So, um, as, uh, as, 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 you've, as you've understood that they are just, the proteins are just adsorbed they don't penetrate too deep inside the bilayer. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, would it be possible to uh, come up or target them in such a way that you just kind of can just like take them out from the layer? Like if they've aggregated too much and we don't want that aggregation because they're like, like not too deep, they're not penetrated too deep inside. So in principle, would it be possible to kind of take them out and kind of target them like that? Yeah, so would they, so I guess the question is, would they ever dissolve from the membrane? And, and since it's an equilibrium, they will, of course, be on and off. But it seems like the off rate is low. But in principle, you could, if you take away the monomers that are in solution in equilibrium, I mean, you can, in principle, you have to wash. You can, in principle, have a bilayer. If you have a bilayer deposit here and you wash with a stream, then you could wash the protein carbon off. off. That's one thing you can do. But if you want to force, them off, you can actually add thing, there are things called proteases. I mean, let's say you don't want them for purification because they're expensive, but in this case, you would need very small amounts. You can you can start to digest the protein sort of from outside and then yeah. it may dissolve. Mm -hmm. Right, but then that is that is possible chemically, like you can add proteases mm -hmm. and make them de chemically, but then what if, if, you, if you want to make them de biologically? Yeah, and if you want to do any kind of disease treatment, that's more difficult. But then you also have to keep in mind that, and I didn't say that so much, we believe that this cooperative binding of the protein relates to the healthy function of the protein, uh, which of course is less known <laughs> than the, the disease property of the, pro of the protein. Yeah, here we have it. So if you have this property of cooperative binding, so if you think about uh, a membrane, and if you want to bud off a vesicle, if you bind independently, you will be di di distributed over the whole membrane. But if you bind in patches, which this will correspond to if the surface is excessive and more, more like a flat binding, then you would bind in patches and then the patches could then possibly bud off. 
Hmm? Yeah. So you probably don't want to interfere too much. Interfere. I think I think it's it's believed at least to be related to synaptic transmission and and you have a lot of autosomal synapses, but you would like to interfere with aggregation. Yes. And yeah. aggregation is actually lipid induced. So if you have a bilayer that's completely full of protein, what happens is that if you have excess protein, so not this situation, but when all the membrane is coated, if you have excess, it's actually the protein, it seems to be the excess protein that nucleates on the vesicle surface, on the protein that's there. So then you may want to learn more about the interaction of additional layers, so to say, or the more weaker interaction of additional layers of protein. Yeah. So that could be the next question to address. How are they interacting? And how could we possibly interfere okay. with, with that interaction? Hmm? All right. Good question. Thank you. Okay. There is another question from uh, Nicole. So please. Yeah. Hello, Sarah. Thank you very much. Hello, Nicole. <laughs> I haven't seen you in many years. It's nice yeah. to hear you are back. Yeah. Thank you. And you thank have you been in Fiskem for a long time, I know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a great presentation. I have a question about the neutron reflectometry study. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember if, did you use one type of phospholipid in this study? And um, if you use maybe like two different type of phospholipids, can you distinguish like where maybe the alpha synuclein is absorbing preferentially? Like, if it is it one phospholipid type, or is it like? Do you think there is a way to distinguish? Um... Yeah, this is a very good question, uh, and Tommy may correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a memory that we used both PSPC and cardiolipid PC. Yeah. Yeah, and cardiolipin was chosen because that's found that mitochondrial membranes and it's also believed to have a role in Parkinson's disease. Uh, but we didn't see any difference when we changed. So the only difference we saw that we needed a certain amount of negative charge. Mm -hmm. uh, but if there was, if it were, were to penetrate deeper, I think you would see it. And, and Tommy would be the better one to ask how much difference would there need to be to get a significant difference in, in, in the curves. So, I guess if it goes down one angstrom, that's nothing but 10 angstroms, is it? I mean, there, yeah. there must be a limit. How much deeper does it need to go to be yeah. recognized? Uh, yeah, and I am thinking like if you mix like two different types or three different types of phospholipids, uh, can you then in reflectometry measurement distinguish like what is maybe preferential for the alpha synuclein? Mm -hmm. That's also a good question. I think you can. So if you have, if you have, different types of lipids you could do it with one and not the others mm. uh, and so then you would in principle do the measurement three times with different lipids uh, visible or different lipids invisible but you probably want them visible one at a time mm. uh, and then you could see because there, it could be so that you can you cause some kind of asymmetry of the membrane that where the protein is bound maybe one is more common so that is a very that's actually a very good question that one could yeah, address right. yeah. um, mm? Yeah. Because because uh, I will be working with something similar with uh, Emma, mm -hmm. so we will also try to see mm -hmm. like uh, the um, how do you say the um, uh, how the phospholipids are sorting in a membrane. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. this is I why I asked. So thank you very much. Yeah. For, and I think it would be super interesting in this. Yeah. Not, maybe yeah. one wants to do that with vesicles, I guess, because I think it's easier exchange of liquids in the, than in the deposited bilayers. But I may be wrong there. But I think if you do that. I think it was super interesting, and, and especially it would be super interesting with the ganglioside lipids that seem to actually be preferentially taken up in aggregates. And is it so that they are, if you have a, I think if you create vesicles, they will be symmetric. But then when you add the protein, maybe then they become asymmetric in lipid distribution. That would be very interesting to know. Thank you very much for your answer and hope to see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope there will be normal life soon so we can actually see each other. Okay, there is a, a question also from Victoria. Meklesh, do you want to pose it in person or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. I was uh, wondering if you studied uh, the secondary structure of alpha synuclein with uh, FTIR spectroscopy also? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, we did not, but others have done, but we did not. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Hmm? 
And uh, the other question was, I was wondering uh, the cooperative binding, is it because of the electrostatic repulsion because between uh, uh, alpha synuclein and the membranes? And also if uh, you can study this with AFM or uh, I don't know, surface force apparatus, it uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> might be very difficult. But, yeah, yeah, but it's a very good question. And that's a question we would like to have the answer to. Why is it uh, cooperative? Uh, and we, we have many speculations, but we have not done any experiments yet. But so it could be either I mean, cooperativity means that a protein that adsorbs to a membrane rather adsorbs next to another one than on a bare membrane. So there is some synergistic effects with higher affinity next to another protein. So there must be some kind of attraction uh, between the protein molecules when they are in the membrane. Uh, uh -huh. And if it's electrostatic, it has to be then that they somehow are organized so that the N-terminal part of one is close to the C-terminal and another one. But it could also be the hydrophobic interactions because the hydrophobic interactions are of course responsible for forming the alpha helix, which is very, what you call, polarized. It has a hydrophobic side and the charges are on the upside, but there is maybe some hydrophobic also on the sides that may interact. We don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I mean, there are many ways to address this, either to try to do more measurements and another way is of course to do mutants of the protein where one thing, oh, it's probably due to those residues, but can you take them away? Uh, uh -huh. uh, the problem with mutation studies is that they often uh, open more questions than they answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you, yeah. you make mutants to answer one question and you're, but I think an important, a very interesting path to go is to actually look at the familiar mutants. So there are mutants that are prevalent in families that more easily get Parkinson's disease. Maybe they have something to do with uh, making this healthy function less. Uh, and I, Nicole actually made quite a lot of them. So we still have in our freezer a little collection of of mutants, and we have also ordered clones so that we can uh, selectively flow or label some of these mutants. So, so that's one way to go is to mutate certain types of residues and see if it changes. But one can also vary, there is also things like physical parameters like temperature and salt that's cheaper than making mutants, or cheaper in time especially, because you can vary the hydrophobic effect that is very temperature dependent. An electrostatic effect, you can screen your swords. So, so there are things, there are tricks you can play. Is there anything you can do to get the cooperativity going away? That would also help to understand what it's due to. Mm. Mm? Yeah, thank you.